Welcome back, geology fans. The immediate cause of earthquakes is seismic waves, energy waves moving through the earth. These seismic waves are like ripples in water. We have to look for their ultimate source, the place where the waves start from. A map of the sources of earthquakes should be recognizable to our regular viewers as being a basic map of the tectonic plate boundaries. Divergent boundaries manage only weak, shallow quakes, while the conservative boundaries release energy shallow to intermediate in depth with weak to fairly strong quakes. Convergent boundaries depend on the type, but those with a subduction zone have shallow quakes at the trench and get deeper below the overriding plate, while the mountains made at convergent boundaries also pop at varying depths and energy levels. Some of the deep-focused earthquakes on convergent subduction zones are the strongest and most devastating. But what is it that is happening at these boundaries that they give the long periods of boredom and the brief periods of terror? How is the energy stored up over time and then suddenly released? This Muscovite sample is demonstrating elasticity, or elastic strain. Rocks in general can be elastic and bend until the stress gets too much and there is movement along a fault as rocks on either side snap back to a less stressed condition. The energy is stored in the elastic strain in the rock. More bending and deformation means more stored energy. When the break occurs, the rocks rebound to a less stressed position, releasing that stored potential energy as kinetic moving energy that we call seismic waves. This idea of generating seismic waves is called the elastic rebound theory and is the main explanation for earthquakes on plate boundaries. These boundaries are the focal points where stresses easily build up an elastic strain in rocks. But as we saw in our last episode, not all earthquakes take place at plate boundaries. Both weak and relatively strong quakes can be intercontinental in origin, but still have their main root cause in elastic rebound. Earthquakes can take place along mountain chains, even in the middle of a continent like the Rocky Mountains, both as they rise up and as they wear down. The crust floats on the Earth's mantle like wood floats in water. If I take a block of wood and put it in water, it sinks down a bit with the rest of the block still above water level. But if I put more blocks on top, the stack of blocks sinks down deeper into the water, but it also stands up higher. Once our blocks of wood are floating at a stable height, they are at equilibrium and won't shift vertically. But take away a block and watch the bottom pop up. If you see a portion of crust lifted up high into mountains... It was also crunched down into the mantle as well. As we erode the mountains, the roots pop back up, and do so in fits and starts by accumulating elastic strain that gets periodically released by elastic rebound. The floating of the Earth's crust upon the mantle is called isostasy, and when deposition loads a basin full of sediment, it can sag the crust down into the mantle, and if erosion or melting of massive glaciers take place fast enough, the crust rises up in what is known as isostatic rebound. Flow within the mantle can cause further vertical movement of the crust and lead to earthquakes through elastic rebound, just as on the plate boundaries. But not all earthquakes are generated through basic elastic rebound, Volcanoes erupt, sometimes with violent enough force to generate significant earthquakes. The gas pressure behind the rising magma explodes out like the gas is exploding from the muzzle of a gun. They create a shock wave that can distort the atmosphere and create sound pressure waves, but can send enough of this energy into the ground to create earthquakes as well. Only the most explosive volcanoes can shake the ground anywhere near what plate boundary earthquakes can achieve. The eruption of Mount St. Helens, though, shows another mode of generation of earthquakes. Landslides. The explosive eruption of St. Helens created a larger earthquake, but the landslide preceding it can be detected in ground shaking slightly before the eruption. Landslides can produce minor ground shaking as they move the sides of mountains. When explosives are used to set off avalanches or landslides, there is a distinct earthquake signal from the explosive itself before the shaking of the avalanche. 
Natural explosions, such as quarry floor explosions or mine wall explosions, will create small seismic waves, as will our conventional artificial explosives. There is one kind of natural explosion, if you're willing to call it that, which is competitive with the largest plate boundary earthquakes. Collision with our planet from asteroids, meteors, and comets can be a large pebble dropped in our big spherical pond. Some truly violent earthquakes are possible from this extraterrestrial impact or mode of generation. We said conventional explosives only make minor shaking compared to nature, but as we get into nuclear explosions, a bit more energy is released. But even the largest of all thermonuclear bombs ever detonated, a monster hydrogen bomb in Russia, was a couple of orders of magnitude less energy released than some of the largest natural earthquakes formed by elastic rebound at plate boundaries. The moving Earth and colliding space balls can store and release much more energy than one or a few of our most powerful piddly bombs. But it may give some an anthropocentric pride that we can make earthquakes at all. We actually found another way to cause earthquakes back in the 1960s on accident. In my backyard, Rocky Mountain National Arsenal was using deep well injection to dispose of some of their more nasty liquid wastes. They began pumping in 1962, and earthquakes were detected about a month later, and lasted until their number reached near 200, most small, but the largest getting up to compete with our largest nuclear bombs. The waxing and waning of these Denver earthquakes turned out to perfectly coincide with deep well injection at Rocky Flats. It appeared that by pumping fluid into the ground, one could induce earthquakes. The same story is being played out today in Oklahoma and other places where fracking for natural gas has become prevalent. This is a shot of fracking pads from a recent flight I took over Oklahoma. The rise in Oklahoman earthquakes and fracking is not only coincidental, but the causal mechanism has been known since the 1960s. Fluid pumped in distressed areas can lower friction along faults and allow them to slip more easily. Here are fracking pads over Pennsylvania, where similar earthquakes have been generated. Earthquakes induced by hydraulic pressure have also been seen near dams as their lakes are filled and the weight of water presses into the rocks below. There is some debate that this last issue is not a true generating cause of earthquakes, but just a way to induce the earthquakes on rocks already stressed by the natural forces of tectonic and isostatic stresses that we discussed previously. Current evidence suggests otherwise, indicating fracking causes earthquakes that mostly would never have occurred without that extra push. An increase in hydraulic pressure caused by fracking or loading from large lakes formed behind dams is thus another mode of earthquake generation. In a more positive light, we could also think that hydraulic loading may be a way to induce a smaller earthquake before a larger one builds up, and perhaps know more precisely when it will rupture. Despite all the recent attention fracking-induced earthquakes have received lately, a recent compilation of all human-induced earthquakes has shown that fracking is not the main cause. Rather, mine collapse is. Mines are dugout pockets underground with negative pressure on the evacuated space, and though most collapse of these structures are small, some large collapses can release more significant amounts of energy. Most damage from mine collapse is local to the disturbance, as it can directly impact the surface. If you live in an area of former mining, you can buy a substance insurance, and if you don't and end up like this, you're going to foot the bill. The last mechanism has been thought of for over a century and was only proven in the last year of this recording. The moon definitely experiences tidal deep quakes, but do tides influence earthquakes as well? When I produced the Earth and Environmental Systems podcast, it was known that tides could predict small earthquakes around volcanic areas, but more recently, it has been shown that some larger quakes in their overall pattern show resonance with tidal forcing. The pull of the sun and the moon can be the straw that breaks the camel's back of stressed rocks. Ultimately, then, we see six main modes of generation. Tectonic and isostatic stresses, volcanic eruptions, landslides, explosions and impacts, 
the increase in hydraulic pressure as an inducer and threshold diminisher for earthquakes, and tidal forcing from the sun and moon's gravitational pulls. But not all earthquake waves are equal. In fact, they are quite different. When we come back next time, we will explore the types of seismic waves, their distinguishing properties, and hint at how we can use them to explore the Earth's interior, here on Earth Explorations. <laughs>